Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jesse the Plants. We love bringing you new videos every week. And I know you enjoy watching them. So like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit that notification bell so you will know when new content is posted. Like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Now sit back and watch this. We're going to continue with our Gospel of John, part 13. This is Jesus healing a man born blind. So let's turn to John chapter 9. We've been going through this uh, whole gospel, but I just want you to encourage people to come, maybe invite some friends. They don't have to have been through the whole um, lessons. You can jump in at any point because they're really standalone teachings. And, uh, but they are interconnected but they can get something out of each one. So I just want y'all to encourage and invite friends and church members and family members because they all need to get in the Word of God. Amen? Amen? And I believe the Lord will put someone on your heart to do that. So, you know, throughout the Gospels, we read how Jesus went everywhere teaching, preaching, and healing. And multitudes were healed by Jesus during his earthly ministry. And the four Gospels give us uh, details on only 20 of them, 20 different ones. Some of them are overlapped and mentioned in, different, in, in several different Gospels in different manners and different uh, details are, are uh, revealed. But there's a total of 20 is what I've researched and heard. Uh, I learned that from Keith Moore, and I believe him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he had an excellent teaching on just on all of those healings. But we, in the Gospels already, we have studied two of them in our series in the Gospel of John, and here we are just in the chapter 9 today. First, we talked about well, the first healing was about the nobleman's son. That was in chapter 4. And then the crippled man at the pool of Bethesda we talked about in, in John chapter 5. Tonight we're going to study another healing that's found only in the Gospel of John. And if you've been with us on Wednesday night, you already know that the religious leaders of Jesus that day when Jesus was moving, walking around had an intense hatred for him. And last week in, when we studied chapter 8, we saw that it begins with the self-righteous wanting to stone an adulterous woman, and it ended with them wanting to stone a sinless Messiah. So that hatred had just bought, was boiling over. And so we're going to read John chapter 9, verse 1 through 5, first of all, and then we'll look into some of the things in just the first part. We're going to go through the whole chapter tonight, and y'all are going to help me to do that. <laughs> As I know we're going to go deep, I have quite a few scriptures to go to, and I want to see it myself in the Word. I'm not, it's not printed in my iPad, so I'm going to follow it. That way I can stick with y'all when y'all are flipping and turning, too, so I don't get ahead of you. So John chapter 9, verse 1 through 5, is this the King James? It says, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You see, Jesus' disciples must have known that this man was blind from his birth because they just, they asked him because they just must have known him. So that's why they asked him if it was his fault or his parents. But Jesus corrected this wrong belief and he told them that it was neither this man nor his parents. And that's an attitude with a lot of people when they see someone in a problem, they just want to judge and criticize. Jesus gave a strong instruction on, on all of this. Let's turn to Luke chapter 13 and see some more about this, another place where this kind, similar type of question came to Jesus. Stay at John 9. You know we're going to go, we're going to go through the whole chapter, so you may want to keep a, uh, your finger there or a ribbon or something. But many uh, people in ancient times believed that serious birth defects and calamities were the problem or the result, the product of personal sin. And let's read Luke chapter 13 verse 1 through 5 together. Luke 
chapter 13, 1 through 5. It says, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering saith, said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. Supp Let me say it again. Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Are those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You see, since their theology of that day attributed individual sufferings to individual sin, the Jews interpreted the fate of these Galileans as God's punishment for their guilt. And you know, that's an attitude that you see a lot of places. But that's not what God does. You see, this view of God's activity is known as retribution theology. You know, if you do this, God's going to do that. He's going to get you. All these things we've all probably heard growing up. But Jesus transfers the meanings of these incidents into the spiritual realm. He doesn't deal with the, the retribution theory, but he points to the urgent demand of the present, which is, unless you repent, you're going to all likewise perish. We're in the world, but not of it. It, it rains on the just and the unjust. We all know these verses of Scripture. So there are things that happen in the world, and just because it happens doesn't mean a person or you did something wrong. You know, I have often told you all that the devil trespasses. He is not a, a fair. He trespasses illegally. And so it's our responsibility to push him back. So there are going to be things that we deal with in this life. Jesus even told his disciples, in this world you're going to have tribulation. But what did he say? Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The Amplified says, I have, robbed, I have robbed it of its power to harm you. Isn't that good? Yes. So uh, this is what, what was going on. Uh, Jesus didn't deal with the retribution theory. He pointed out the urgent demand of the present, which is, unless you repent. So really, when we see a tragedy, we should just make sure our heart's right, make sure we're at the right place, not trying to condemn someone else. And repentance is demanded by God as a condition for forgiveness and grace. Jesus dismissed the idea that accidents or human cruelties were God's judgment especially on bad sinners. So they tried to do that when we were over there in the Gospel of John, chapter 9. The disciples themselves are the ones who asked. They saw this man who they knew was blind from birth. And, they, and, and the question to Jesus, instead of going to this man, maybe hugging on him, can I get you something, can I help you? No, hey, hey, what about this guy over here? Was it him? Was he the one? What did he do? You know, to be in this state. Or maybe it was his mom and dad. They even had a theory in that day that they would, could sin in the womb. How stupid is that? But I'm telling you, Jesus came to straighten things out and put things straight. Amen? Amen. No matter how or when it occurs. Uh, well, I jumped ahead on my notes. Let me go back up. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm going ahead of myself. But Jesus dismissed the idea that accidents or human cruelties were God's judgment especially on bad sinners. So neither the Galileans nor the workers should be blamed for their calamities because that tower fell or because the, the pilot went in there and, and they were sacrificing and he went and he killed them. So their blood, their human blood and the blood of their sacrifice was mingled and they were concerned. Why did this happen? Were these guys bad? Was, was this a judgment of God? No, it was not a judgment of God. This was just, we live in a fallen world and bad things happen and we need to just make sure that, that we're, Pray, we're sticking close to God and believing him and trusting him to protect us. Amen? Amen. So uh, whether a person is killed in a tragic accident or miraculously survives is not a measure of their righteousness. You can't go by that. Jesus did not explain why some live while others die tragically. He didn't even go there. So we don't need to. We don't have to answer every question. Just be there to love and, on people and be kind to them and not judgmental. Amen? Amen. So no matter, the, the only thing that Jesus really addressed in that situation was the spiritual realm. 
He said, he pointed to everyone's need for repentance, that we need to make sure that our hearts are right. Because really, you don't have a promise of tomorrow many times. And we're, we you know, if, we, if Jesus tarries, all of us are going to go by the way of the grave. So we have to make sure that we live a life that ensures that we're going to go to heaven at the end of our life here on this earth. Amen? Amen. So no matter how or when it occurs, death, though, is not the end. Jesus promises that those who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's the promise we really have, the eternal promise. <clears throat> and so sin, sickness, and death came upon all mankind. You know, because you wonder, well, why, how, well, how did this all happen? Well, it came on all mankind when Adam listened to the devil and disobeyed God's command while they were in the Garden of Eden. So, but Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin, and he destroyed the works of the devil. There's so many scriptures in the Bible about this, and I just want us to go to four of them really quickly. We're going to turn first to John chapter 10, verse 10. We're already at really close. Maybe it's on the next page for you. It is for me if you're back at the uh, Gospel of John. John chapter 10, verse 10, very familiar verse of scripture. This is the, uh, what we're going to study more about this next week. But it says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You see, that's Jesus' plan. Even though the enemy came into the earth, turned everything upside down, God created a perfect environment. But mankind sinned, and that turned everything upside down. That's why there's tragedy. That's why there's sin. God can't be blamed for this. Even on insurance policies, they'll have, list things as called an act of God. That's not an act of God. There's no such thing as Mother Nature. But all of this stuff is stuff, stuff we need to just wise up and learn that there is, there's a, a, a devil in the earth, and God has given us authority over him, but we have to follow uh, the leading of the Spirit, we have to listen to God as well. Amen? Amen. So Romans chapter 10, I mean, D John chapter 10, verse 10, we've read that one. So familiar. That's one that I've memorized. But I wanted to read it. Sometimes you've got to look at it in the book with your own eyes. Let's turn to Romans chapter 5 to look at the next verse that reveal that Jesus destroyed the works. This is the plan. He destroyed the works of the devil. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 can almost read that whole chapter 5, but we're just going to read verse 8. It says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, that was the dilemma. Satan came, took over the earth. God needed someone to take it back. And Jesus came and died for us while we still were sinners, before we ever knew him. 36 years ago, Renee didn't know God. 35 years ago, she did. I mean, just think from one day to the next, you, did, you don't know God and how your life has changed. While we were still in our sin, God died for us. That is so beautiful. And even if we mess up today, we can go to him and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me, and he will. We don't have to run away from him when we miss it or mess up. Next verse I want you to look at is just the next page, Romans chapter 6. I want you to read verse 23 just shows you the. this is all kind of connected with what Jesus was talking about, about how, how important repentance is and the, the fact that sin is in the earth. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. See, he, he commended his love to us that while we were at sinners, he died for us. And then he says, but the wages of sin is death. He died for us so that we don't have to die. He gave us a gift of eternal life. And the last one that I want us to look at in this section about uh, how Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin, for our sin, is 1 John uh, chapter 3, verse 8. 1 John, that's the epistles of John. Chapter 3, verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. 
So that was his purpose in coming. So he knew what he came here, what he was born for. And he did it, right? He went to the cross and he died on the cross and he rose from the dead. And he took care of that whole uh, sin problem. So the purpose of telling us about this man that was in John chapter 9, if you want to just go back there, you can. John chapter 9, that they, Jesus passed by. You know, he was, it was still that day where they were around the, the temple area. He had just passed away from them trying to stone him. But here he caught his eye. He sees this man that's blind, and he walks. He didn't pass him by. His disciples asked him, uh, did this guy sin or did his daddy and mama sin? But this is put in the scriptures for a reason. Only 20 out of the whole New Testament record, uh, or, or the Gospels is uh, the details about 20 healings. Although Jesus, we know, healed the multitudes. So these 20 must be very important for us to study, for us to learn something about them. The purpose of telling us about this man that was born blind is to teach us that illness and disease is, disease is not always due to one's personal sin. See, the enemy is working overtime to put condemnation and, pro, and you know, attacking us in one way or another. When things don't go right, you think, oh, I must have done so. Trying to pull us off of our, our walk with the Lord and help cause us to give up. But it's, you know, often it's due to the fact that we live in a fallen world that's riddled with sin and evil. And so we just need to wise up. You know, Jesus wants us to be as wise as a serpent and harmless as doves. When attacks come, don't be a, a, a surprised. Uh, what did Peter say? Think it not strange when these fiery trials come upon you, because that's what the devil does. It's time for us to grow up, Amen. right? Things are happening in the earth, and God is raising up a people that when they recognize something that's out of order, we use our authority and speak to it, and you tell it to get back in order. You don't just roll over and... and or pull the sheet over your head. No, no, you stand firm, find what the Word says about it, and speak it and say what the Word says. Amen? Amen. I mean, there's just too many uh, baby Christians around. We need to grow up. They're like dragging our pampers around, wearing di diapers. It's time to grow up. And it doesn't matter how old or how young you are in the Lord. You can grow up quickly. If you're, if you're dedicated in, in, to the Word and studying the Word, the Holy Spirit can help you and guide you on what to do and what to say. Let's read John chapter 9, verse 4, one more time. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. I love that, that verse of scripture. That's, you know, and it just reminds me of our theme for this year. Go do the work. We've been talking about that all year long. The work of Jesus is a good work, and it's, it's a work that shares the gospel. It's a work that shares the love of Jesus. It's the work that that he's called each one of us do it in a different way. We all have a different uh, group of people that we're impacting. But that's what we're called to do. Jesus knew what he came for. And that word day signifies Jesus' messianic ministry. And the night referred to his crucifixion when he was saying this for his disciples. That's the only period of time where he could not do anything. While he was here, there on the earth with them, he was able to help them. He was able to pray for this. You'll see how he prayed for this blind man, and the blind man was healed. You'll see after his uh, resurrection how he, and he, his, his uh, disciples were empowered and anointed. He sent him out to continue doing what he did. Amen? Amen? So the miraculous accomplishments and deeds of Jesus are the works of God. That's why he says, I'm doing the works of God. All these things he did were God's works. And his very interesting statement from the mouth of Jesus, it shows us six things. Number one, he had a precise work to do upon the earth. He had something to do. He knew God gave him an assignment. And you know, you all know that, they, that he was always in prayer. He knew he was always getting up to the, min, up to the minute instructions, divine instructions for what was ahead Number two, he was continue, continually about his father's business. He was, all, that's, he was, um, was mission-minded. He was focused. He only did what his father told him to do, was number three. And number four, he only said what his father told him to say. These are things we already know about the life of Jesus. Number five, everything that Jesus did on earth was just the works of God. Think about that. His life demonstrated what our God is like. What would he do if he came across somebody 
that was blind uh, from birth. We'll find out in a moment. Anybody that was sick, he, he fed the multitudes. He was a great, great savior. Number six, each work had instructions about the precise time and place. Like we said last week, Jesus was on a divine timetable, and he knew what he was about. And I think a lot of these things we could see ourselves in. We, God gives us a precise work to do. We all have an assignment to do in our own particular life. And these things that if we obey God, then God is glorified and, and people are reached. Amen? Amen. I looked at this, uh, this scripture in John chapter 9, verse 4, in Rick Renner's Sparkling Gems from the Greek, volume 2. He has a translation of this one verse. Listen to it. It's so powerful the way he translated it because he's a Greek scholar. And I love the way he puts these together when he researches word for word. He says, for me, there is no option. For what is before me is certainly compulsory. I was sent specific, specifically for this mission and this moment. This is Jesus. He's saying this. He's interpreting the word. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. He says, I was sent specifically for this mission and this moment. I will answer to the one who sent me regarding how I carry out this assignment. Therefore, I must give myself completely to the task before me and do it enthusiastically and passionately. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, no matter what he did, he did it with all his heart. And that's what we're to do. We're to do what we call, God's called us to do with all our heart. Looking at Tyler right there. Man, when he gets on those drums, he's doing it with all his heart. You can see that. And the joy that he has in doing it spreads the joy to all of us. The little drummer boy on Sunday <laughs> grew up. <laughs> but it's such a blessing to see that. Let's continue reading in the Gospel of John. We're going to read it from verse 6 through verse 12 together. It says, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. But he said, I am he. Verse 10, therefore they said they unto him, how were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, a man is, that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, go wash in the pool of Siloam and go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they say unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. So this passage of Scripture was so powerful. It tells this whole story of what happened to this man. Can you just imagine how he this? I mean, he was already blind, right? So you can hear when he's listening. He couldn't see Jesus, but he definitely could probably hear him spit. You know, <laughs> what is going on? You know, but he let him do it. He just... Submitted to whatever Jesus, you know, I'm like that. You know, Lord, whatever you want, <laughs> I'm, I'm here for you. And so he put the, the clay on his eyes, and then he couldn't see where he was going, but he had to find his way. I don't know how far away that pool was from where he, he had met Jesus, but I know it wasn't a short distance. So you know a lot of people had to have seen him trying to maybe hugging the walls or looking around. Maybe with, if he had a stick, somebody led him. I don't know how he got there, but he followed through, and he did that. This pool of Siloam was built on the south end of the city of Jerusalem by Hezekiah. And his workers constructed an underground tunnel from a spring that was outside the city walls to carry water into the city. Everybody was familiar with this, this uh, pool. In fact, this is the same pool of water that they drew the water from when we talked about a few chapters back when they had that water ceremony on the, on the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, the, his workers had constructed this underground tunnel so they can carry water into the city. And it was especially important during the times of siege so that the people could get water without being fear of being attacked whenever there was a, a, a war going on. And it was a source of water, like I told you, for the ceremonies of this festival of the tabernacles. 
But when Jesus spat on the ground and made mud in order to repair this man's eyes, he was working with original materials. Think about that. Genesis chapter 2, you don't have to go there. Verse 7 talks about how God formed Adam's body from the dust of the ground. And Jesus was demonstrating a creator's awareness of the materials he first used to shape the human body. Can you imagine that? As he had done when he originally made human beings, out of the dust of the ground, Jesus may have used clay to fashion a brand new pair of eyes. I've seen a lot of blind people. Some, you know, they have the sunglasses on, you can't tell what their eyes look like. Some just have, their eyes are cloudy, and some there's no eyeball there. And I'm sure a lot of us have seen that. Some happens from an accident or whatever, but this person was born that way. So it's, it's so amazing to see that God use that. We don't know why he did it. It doesn't explain why. We don't have to know why. But we just it does remind you that that dust was important. He wrote in that dust when he was when they were accusing that woman of adultery. You know, this all of this is connected and, and it's so beautiful the way he does that. I want us to look at two more passages of scripture in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus used his, his spit to heal someone. I just think since we're talking about spit, let's just go there. I know it was important to do it that way. It, it had his, oh, my, wouldn't you want the anointing of Jesus? I mean, I've been around people that, uh, you know, when, when you're sweating and, and you're preaching and you spit on people, you worry about it, you know, but they, they're not worried about that. Yeah. I remember one time Jesse was telling how he told the story, how he's praying for somebody. God called him to call a lady. I was when he first started moving in the gifts of the Spirit, and he started he said, lady back there with the green dress, we're in a little tiny church. He says, I want you to come forward. And all, that's all he knew, that God said, come forward. He didn't know what he was going to tell her. But when he brought her forward, the Lord told him what to say. But while he was talking to her, she had her hands up and her eyes closed. And he noticed that a, a wad of white spit came out of his mouth and hit her right in the eye. And, oh, he was terrified. He was not terrified, but he was, he was upset about that, kind of embarrassed, I guess. And so, but she was, received what he said. She fell in the spirit <clears throat> and was so blessed. And she was trying to get to him after the service and he was trying to avoid her. <laughs> Y'all may have heard him tell this story. So she said, Brother Jesse, I want to talk to you. He's run, trying to get away. He didn't want to even confront her. And she says, oh, when you prayed for me, it was so powerful. It was kind of like a mist, she said. <laughs> <laughs> so God can use anything, amen? But here he chose, Jesus chose to use the spit. And we're going to look at this in Mark chapter 7, verse uh, 32 through 35. We'll read that. I think it's Mark 7, 32. It says, and they bring him one that was deaf, and he had an impediment in his speech, and they beseech him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears, and he spit, and he touched his tongue. And he looked up to heaven and sighed and saith unto him, Ephathatha, whatever, how you pronounce it, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. Praise the Lord. Isn't that awesome? So who knows why he did it this way? We don't have to imitate that, but this is what happened in that day. The next one is in the next page, chapter 8, verse 22 through 25. We'll just read this. It's just important that you see the cross-referencing. I want to teach you that when you study the Word of God yourself, don't just read that instance. Go back and research and see where it's done in another place in the Word of God. That's just part of the lesson tonight. But that's how I study the Word of God. I want to see where did this happen somewhere else in the Bible, and how was it? Uh, what, what else can I learn about it? And God wants us to think deeply, not just go surface, right? So Mark 8, chapter, 20, uh, chapter 8, verse 22, uh, we're going to read down to verse 25. And, the, and he cometh to Bethes, Bethsaida, and they bring him a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw aught. Listen to this one. We're going to learn something new from this one as well. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. 
After that, he put his hands again on his eyes and he made him to look up. He was, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying neither, well, we don't have to go there, but he, he, this man was totally whole and clean and healed and he spit on his eyes too. So just, I don't know how many more got this, but you know what, like I told you, there was 20 details about healings. We've just read through uh, three to just tonight and all of them had to do with spit. So it was anointed spit, apparently. But the purpose of all these testimonies is to teach us that Jesus is, is God who has authority and power to heal. But also from this last story, I want to just show you that it's okay to pray again. Jesus prayed more than once. You know, you've heard people say sometimes that if you pray a second time, you're not prayed in faith. That's not true. Jesus prayed again. He taught us to ask and keep on asking. Knock and keep on asking. I say, don't give up. Keep moving on, pressing it. Jesus taught a parable about that woman who didn't give up, and she went to the judge, and, he, and I think they call it the inopportune woman. It's always a woman. And she just ha- was kept coming after him and says, let So he decides to give it to her because lest she weary me with her continual coming. This is the kind of prayer God, we, you know, you really really have to seek God and and purpose to, to get what you came for. Don't give up. This was this passionate way that Jesus approached life. He was enthusiastic and passionate about everything that he did. And this is how we, we should model our lives as well. Well, let's continue reading John chapter 9. Back to the 9. I got my red ribbon for that one. John chapter 9. We're going to read verse 13 all the way to 34. So it's quite a bit of passage. And then we'll comment on it. John chapter 9 again, verse 13. And they brought unto the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, he put clay on mine eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. Verse 17. And they say unto the blind man again, what saith thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. So this is a big to-do. Think about it. Maybe pulling him in here. Not like, okay, we don't believe him. Let's call his daddy and his mom in here. Verse 19. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind, and they said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Where are there, whether he, oh, This is a, a, a pivotal verse right here. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Wow. Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? Then they reviled him. He was was sarcastic, and they got aggravated. He says, then they reviled him and and said, thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. Verse 30, the man answered and said unto them, Wherein is, where, why then, excuse me, why herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but, he, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doth his will, him he heareth. 
Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of the one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And they answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. You see, this section of the story of the healing of the blind man reveals some key characteristics about willful unbelief. These guys just didn't want to believe. And, you know, I just have to address this part here where he says we know that God doesn't hear sinners. This is, a man, this is truthfully quoted, re, uh, recorded, because that's what the man said. But it's not a statement of truth. You know, there's a lot of statements in the Bible that are truthfully recorded, but they're not necessarily a statement of truth. Because we know God hears sinners, because I was a sinner when I cried out to him. And he, he, the Bible really doesn't say that, but this is what this man quoted, and that's just a little side note. No charge for that. <laughs> but there's so many things about unbelief that I just want you to see, and I have too much notes, so I'm not going to go in detail about it. I'm just going to read the highlights of it. Unbelief sets false standards. Unbelief always wants more evidence, but never has enough. Unbelief doesn't does biased research on a purely subjective basis. They're just, they, they don't really want to know the truth. They're just talking. No matter what you say, no matter how uh, legitimate the argument and the explanation is, they don't want to hear it. Uh, unbelief rejects the facts, and unbelief is self-centered. I'm not gonna, and I have more notes on in each, all of those, we're not gonna go there, because I have so much other good stuff I want to get to. But, we already know a lot of these things about unbelief, and that's really not what this study's about anyway. But John included in this section on the dialogue of the Pharisees with the blind man, uh, he included this in his teaching, in his gospel. It was so important, and he did it probably for two reasons. First of all, it, it demonstrates the character of willful and fixed unbelief because Jesus went out of his way to try to help and convince these people. I know a lot of us, we go out of our way to try to help and convince people and, we, and, you know, that, that just means my conscience is clear. I've done everything that I can do. And then it's, I just leave it in the hands of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And the second thing, the story confirms the first great schism between the synagogue and Christ's new followers. This blind man was the first known person to be thrown out of the synagogue because he chose to follow Jesus. You see, by now the man who had been blind had heard the same question over and over. He didn't know why or how he was healed. He didn't even ask. You know, a lot of people came to Jesus seeking to be healed. This man didn't even ask. He didn't even know to ask. But Jesus decided, just like the man at the pool when we talked about it, the man was just laying there. Jesus went up to him, and he did both of those on the Sabbath day. It's like he's trying to pick a fight with these people. But I, I think he's trying to open their eyes. You know, the Sabbath was made for man, not a man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was, is a good thing, but you can put any good thing, out, out, you know, way out, out of line. You can go too far on any good thing. So he tried to correct them, and he even showed them that, yes, you do things on the Sabbath too. If your donkey falls in a ditch, you're going to pick that baby up because that's money. That donkey's worth some money. You're going to take care of the money. So he healed a person. Isn't this person worth much more than a donkey? So their, their arguments and criticisms of him weren't even logical. They didn't even make sense. The Pharisees questioned the man, but, he ref but they refused to believe that Jesus had healed him, even with the parents there, even with the man there. Despite the obvious evidence, the scoffing Pharisees threw the healed man out of the temple. Think about that, how you could have just had a healed person to encourage the other people that were sick. Look, if you just believe God too, maybe you, God can do the same for you. He's no respecter of persons. Let's believe God for your healing too. That's what we do here. We give testimonies of people being healed and, and touched and, and delivered. And that's because we want to encourage others to believe for the same. Yeah. They didn't think this way. Instead, they cursed him and evicted him from the synagogue. You know, persecution sometimes comes when you follow Jesus. I know many of us in here may have experienced some of that. You may lose friends. You may even lose your life. In some nations, they do. But no one can ever take away the eternal life that Jesus gives to you. Amen? Amen. In chapter 9, we see four different reactions to Jesus. Number one, we see the neighbors 
revealed surprise and skepticism when they saw this friend of theirs or this man they knew that was once blind that could now see. The Pharisees showed disbelief and prejudice. The parents believed but kept quiet for fear of excommunication. I think that's probably the saddest group right there, that the parents wouldn't even stand up for their child and because they, they wanted the acceptance of the church and the people more than their child. And the healed man, that's the fourth person, his reaction, he showed consistent growing faith. And each reaction to Jesus allowed this man to, to uh, reach a clearer understanding of the one who had healed him. Let's continue reading John chapter 9, 35 through the end of the chapter. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Thus dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see might not see, and they that they which might see, which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard those words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Verse 41, Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remaineth. You see, Jesus moved the discussion from the physical blindness to spiritual blindness. And blindness in the Bible is a metaphor for spiritual darkness or an inability to discern God or his truth. But, you know, these Pharisees should have known the scriptures. They were ignorant of the scriptures that clearly revealed that the Messiah would restore sight to the blind. They should have found that in their scriptures. And let's go there. I want you all to look in Isaiah. We're going to look at three different verses in Isaiah before we uh, move on. Isaiah chapter 29 is the first one. Isaiah 29, verse 18. They were ignorant of the scriptures that clearly revealed that the Messiah would restore sight to the blind. Isaiah 29, verse 18 <clears throat> says, And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. Now these are just three. There's many more, but we're going to look at another one. Verse 35 And verse 5, it's just a few pages over. And it says, uh, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Isn't that powerful? See, that's clearly in their scriptures. And they, they really revered and looked up to Isaiah as, as, a, as a major prophet. And the next one is in verse chapter 42, verse 7. really read more of it, but I'm just going to put it down to that one verse. To open the blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, and to sit in the, and, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. So this is really talking about the mess, that's a messianic scripture there, and there's many above it and below it. You may can read it at your, your uh, home and study that out yourself, because Jesus wanted them to know that they were spiritually blind. And this chapter that we've studied today in John chapter 9 tells the story about Jesus giving light both physically and spiritually to a blind man who lived in darkness. See, this blind man got it all. You know, he was spiritually uh, dark, as uh, blind, as well as blind physically, but he got both. He got that double portion. Wow, Amen. think about that. That's available. For, that's what he got that day. So the, but uh, this story ends that we just read with a splendid reversal of roles. The blind man who assumed to be in spiritual darkness could see God's light. But the Pharisees who could see physically and were thought to be enlightened were shown to be spiritually blind. So to believe in Jesus means to see spiritually. And those who don't believe in him remain blind. And this, this spiritual blindness is a big deal, but the, Jesus came, actually, 
healing the physical blindness. Remember when John the Baptist went into prison and uh, they, he sent his disciples to Jesus to ask him, is he the one or should we wait for another? Even though he was there at Jesus' baptism and heard the voice from heaven, saw the dove come down and light on, he knew who he was, but he had these... He was in a, a, a tough spot right then, so he just was questioning. And what did Jesus say? Go tell them what you see, the blind see and the deaf hear. Yes. And the, the poor get the gospel preached to them. I mean, this was the confirmation of what he was called to do as the Messiah. So these people should have known this. They should have recognized that this is what was going on. To believe in Jesus means to see spiritually, but to not believe in him means to remain blind. And when you turn to Christ... You begin to see him differently. Amen? Amen? And the longer that we walk with him, the better we're going to understand who he is. And the more we study his word, we begin to see how he would react in a situation. When someone asks you, what about this person? Look at them. They got all this trouble. They must have done something wrong. No, the devil is the, is the author of all that destruction. He is the one who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. We need to expose that rat for what he is. He came and he oppressed Job for those nine months and tortured him, and his three friends came around him just like those disciples did that day to that blind man. Oh, Job, you must have done something wrong because that just, I know you, and he just admitted, come clean, boy. <laughs> no, he says, I didn't do anything. So, you know, we have all surrounded with people, even if they don't say it with their voices, they may say it with their face. But we have to keep our eyes focused on God. And we don't need to be the one who's pointing the finger either. We need to be the one that's praying and finding the answer, helping someone find their way if they've moved over into a place of confusion. So if you want to know more about Jesus, you've got to keep trusting him every day of your life. Amen? Because he is Amen. such a beautiful Savior. Yeah. And I, I just learned so much studying this chapter and how important it is to realize that God has an answer to every problem. And, and I, don't, I don't have to... I think the reason that he showed so many different ways that he healed people is to, to free us from trying to get into a rut. You know, those Pharisees lived in the rut. What's, what's a rut? It's a, it's a grave with the ends knocked out. They just lived in that nasty place. But God wants us to be free from all of that and, and, and recognize that he came to heal us in every part of our life, Amen. spiritually, physically, and like we often say, financially. <laughs> There's Because we live in an economic world. Amen. Amen. Did y'all enjoy this today? Yeah. Hallelujah. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.